Some miscellaneous stuff from Unit 1. Some odds and ends that don't really fit in very neatly. Have a look. Covalent networks. You might remember that when we did elements in Unit 1, we came across covalent networks. You should recall the elements boron, carbon, and silicon had giant covalent networks. How do we know that? Well, we know that these have got covalent networks, A, because they're non-metals, making them covalent, and B, they've got a very high melting point. The melting point of the elements boron, carbon, and silicon are measured in thousands of degrees. And because they're measured in thousands of degrees, they must have these gigantic structures. But this covalent network structure is not unique to elements. Some compounds can also have a covalent network. And there's two that I'd like to pop up. Here's one of them. We've got silicon dioxide. Silicon dioxide is a covalent network. One good way to get your head around this is to compare silicon dioxide with carbon dioxide. Why would you want to compare those elements? Because, because silicon and carbon are elements in the same group of the periodic table. You would expect them to have similar structures. However, carbon dioxide is a gas and silicon dioxide is a solid. Carbon dioxide is a very low uh, boiling point. Whereas this has a very high boiling point and melting point. So the fact that their melting points and boiling points are vastly different would imply vastly different structures. Let's deal with carbon dioxide first. Carbon dioxide is molecular, made from individual, or some people call them discrete molecules. Here's a little carbon dioxide molecule, a little package. Here's another carbon dioxide molecule. The bonds inside the molecule are strong covalent bonds. But the bonds break up between a weak, pathetic van der Waals forces. So with weak van der Waals forces between the molecules, it's no wonder it's easy to melt and boil carbon dioxide. How does it compare with silicon dioxide? A totally different story. Silicon dioxide is not molecular. If silicon dioxide had a structure something like carbon dioxide, it would be easy to melt, easy to boil. But as a structure more akin to this, the silicons and oxygens arrange themselves into an endless pattern of atoms. Now, you wouldn't be asked to draw this, I didn't like it. But it does make sense. If you look at this diagram I'm drawing, each oxygen atom is forming two bonds, and that's correct, oxygen is a valency of two. And silicon, which is a group four element, is forming four bonds. How long would it take me to draw a structure of silicon dioxide? Well, you, no one could do it in their whole lifetime. There are countless billions of atoms in silicon dioxide. Each of these bonds, remember, is a strong covalent bond. And this is why silicon dioxide is very hard to melt. In fact, sand is effectively silicon dioxide. While we're on the theme of covalent networks, there's another one that we might come across. And it's, cans, it's a carbon... Let me check my facts here for a little second. Yeah, silicon carbide. Silicon carbide. Now, that's a combination of silicon and carbon. Once again, to understand silicon carbide, we can maybe compare it with something that we do know, and that is diamond. Let's revise diamond for a moment. Diamond is just carbon. The carbon atoms in diamond are arranged in an endless array based on tetrahedra. So here is what's supposed to be a representation of diamond, full of strong covalent bonds. Nothing but strong covalent bonds, a giant structure, incredibly hard, incredibly strong, incredibly difficult to melt. Silicon carbide is virtually the same. There's only one difference. It alternates between carbon atoms and silicon atoms. So they're very, very similar to diamond, but not exactly the same. But you can see that it will probably have very similar properties. Silicon carbide, silicon carbide. If you like, it's a poor man's diamond that has many of the characteristics of diamond, the hardness, the toughness, the durability. 
It's used for grinding tools and sharpening metal edges and so on. Um, as I say, very similar to diamond. So that's Covalent Network done. Here's another little thing that bubbled up in Unit 1 that uh, is worth checking out. Solubility. Why do some substances dissolve in water and others don't? Well, we know that when you try to dissolve some substances, some are soluble and some are insoluble. Now this is a huge oversimplification, but it's all we need at this stage. For a substance to be soluble in water, it needs to be polar. It needs to have charges. Why? Because the water has charges. Water molecules have very significant charges on them. And it's the attraction between the charges on the water and on the substance you're trying to dissolve that will determine whether it dissolves or not. Remember, the substance you're trying to dissolve is called the solute. The liquid would be the solvent. So let's take a polar solute. Let's take a, a chemical which is soluble in water. A very simple example would be, let's say, sodium chloride. Ordinary, everyday salt. We take it for granted that salt dissolves in water, but it's something of a miracle. If you think about it, salt has a, a lattice. And this lattice is really, really tough. How do we know this lattice is tough? Well, because its melting point is round about 800 degrees. 800 degrees is what it would take to break this apart, to melt it. But when you put it in water, it disintegrates. Why? It disintegrates because the charges on the ions attract the water molecules. The water molecules are kind of sucked in. They're attracted. And before you know it, the water's got in there, ripped up the lattice, and the lattice has dissolved. Some things which dissolve in water are usually polar. Here's another example. Ethanol. Ethanol has a polar OH group. And because of its polar OH group, again, it dissolves in water. Do you remember the plastic which dissolves in water? Polyethanol also has this group. Now, why do substances be insoluble? Well, because they are non-polar. And a classic example of that would be something like, say, well, here's one that's cropped up in exam in the past. Phosphorus trichloride. Phosphorus trichloride has no charges, or very, if it does, very small charges. There's nothing to attract this to that. The, the only reason why this would dissolve in water would be if this had charges and the water had charges. This will not dissolve in water. It will dissolve in other substances, but it will not dissolve in water, which has charges. A question which has cropped up frequently over the years is, which of these does not dissolve in water? And you might be given three substances which are ionic and one which is not. Remember, these are all chlorides, but the first three are ionic, metal chloride, metal chloride, metal chloride, non-metal chloride is the odd one out. One final point we want to cover in this miscellaneous section is polar bonds and polar molecules. So let's check that one out. Okay? Let me give you some polar bonds. How about, for example, the hydrogen chlorine bond? How do we know that's polar? How do we know this bond has charges? Well, if you look up your data book and check the electron negativities, hydrogen has a small pulling power and chlorine has a large pulling power. Let's take another molecule, another bond, how about the OH bond? For the same reason, this is polar. The oxygen pulls strongly and the hydrogen not so strongly. The electronegativities are different. And here's one final bond, the carbon chlorine bond. This also carbon chlorine bond is also polar. Polar bond, polar bond, polar bond. But let's put these in a molecule and see what happens. Now, I can think of a very simple molecule that contains this bond, and the molecule is a molecule of hydrogen chloride. Now we know the bond is polar. Let's just put that there. Come back to that in just a moment. How about a molecule with an OH bond? Well, water, as we mentioned a moment ago. 
has these polar bonds. There's a polar bond, and there's a polar bond. Can we think of something with this bond? How about, how about this substance? Carbon tetrachloride, or as it should be called, tetrachloromethane. That's effectively methane, where the four hydrogens have been replaced by four chlorines. Look at this. All these charges. Now here's a surprise. Although these molecules contain charges, one of them is classified as a non-polar molecule. Sounds like a contradiction in terms. Let's work it out. Look at this molecule here. It has a definite positive end and a negative end. Not only is the bond polar, but the molecule as a whole is polar. Look at the water molecule. The top end of the water molecule is where the negative charge is, and the bottom end of the water molecule is where the positive charges are. Not only are the bonds polar, but the molecule seen as a whole has a positive and negative end. Now, what about this one? This molecule may have charges, but all around the outside, it's negative. It has no distinct positive and negative end. And the term polar, North Pole, South Pole, means opposites. This has to have an opposite, positive, negative. So, polar, polar, non-polar. Let's look at one or two other examples. Here's another one that pops up a great deal. Carbon dioxide might have charges, but if you look at the molecule as a whole, this end is negative and this end is negative, so the molecule as a whole is non-polar. One other one that pops up a great deal is ammonia. The ammonia molecule, like carbon dioxide, has charges, but this time it's got a definite positive and negative end. We can see that the top end of the molecule is a negative end, and all the positives are down here. Polar molecule, non-polar molecule.